Good morning, everyone. As um, pastor and faith are out of town and Tim's preaching today, he asked me to step in for the Sunday school. Um, I appreciate everyone's prayers from Wednesday. Um, within 24 hours after putting out the request on Wednesday night to uh, have something for today, God put something on my heart finally that worked out. Um, for those who don't know, on Wednesday I asked for prayer because I had like five or six different options and that um, the Holy Spirit wasn't guiding me to either, anything I had to present today. And um, as I prayed, it was, I, he gave, gave me something else totally than what I was working on. But, <clears throat> but I have four or five future lessons or sermons or for Wednesdays or Sundays that I can work with now, <clears throat> which is a good thing. Um, of course, pray for all the, the kids. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Sarah, um, you know, we um, dropped Sarah off at 6.30 and uh, it was a full van load of kids heading to uh, North, North Carolina. Okay, yeah, North Carolina. Um, it's, it's cool for Sarah because at this campus where she accepted Jesus a few years ago, so for her it's like her spiritual birthday, so she was really excited to be heading back down. <clears throat> and um, of course, you know, pray for the, the kids, especially the, one, the, the ones that are unsaved, and there's some that recently accepted Jesus Lord and Savior, and this is their, I think, first camp since then. So it, it's, there's, we're, you know, hope, we're praying for a lot of neat things to happen this week with, uh, all the, with the youth. They're heading down there. But um, th as you all know, this month is June. Does anybody know what, what this month is, what the federal government is making this month? And if you watch TV or read any me uh, media literature, or, or maybe at work, even before you take certain awareness classes, anyone have any idea what, what June is? Happy traditional family day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tim said, happy traditional family day. It's, uh, and, yeah. Unfortunately, it's Pride Month. Yep. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, um, yeah. So today we're going to address address that in um, sodomy in the Bible. Bef um, I don't know if, this, uh, if there, anyone's going to want to post that on YouTube or not. I don't want to get the church any kind of strikes or anything. But we're going to dig into God's Word today, and if YouTube doesn't like it, well, that's life. But um, like I said, as a federal government employee, of course, I've had to take the uh, Pride Month awareness classes and, you know, um, the good thing for me right now is that they have not gotten to the point where I have to sign a statement that I agree with it, so I keep my job. I don't have to get fired for not signing on to it. I just have to test that I took the class and I acknowledge I get which presented the material they want me to say to understand. But um, and I don't mean to rip at any individual people <coughs> that may be of this persuasion. Uh, my wife and I do have friends that are gay. We have um, there was um, um, a married couple in Las Vegas we used to go out with once in a while, and um, and we disagree with the lifestyle. But as people, they were you know great people, and um, I work with a lot of people that are um, are gay, as I'm sure a lot of you do too, and I've seen it. And as you know, and I've family members that go that way. Um, I mean nothing against anyone individually, but God's word is very firm on this subject. So, um, um, first of all, with the terms of homosexuality or lesbianism, the King James Bible doesn't have those words in it. They call it sodomy. And um, sodomy is um, a definition I found of it says sex between two people of the same gender. And, um, <clears throat> and the reason I want to address that tonight, or today, tonight, in the daytime here, is. Um, is I'm getting fed up with seeing it on TV every every time you can't you can't watch the news without some disgusting, perverted commercial or ad or something on TV like that telling you that it's a good thing. Like I said, we live in an era now where, um, like Isaiah said, right they consider wrong to be right and right to be wrong. And some of the uh, the children that a man and I bus here on Wednesdays. Um, they think there's nothing wrong with homosexuality because that's what they're being taught by their parents and their school and the TV and everything they encounter. So I want to ad address that um, today. So if you turn me first to Genesis chapter 1, and that was all you're heading that way. The, the, um, one of the horrible things about that lifestyle and that mindset is that it messes with God's created order for what a male and female roles are supposed to be. 
as you all know, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Breed fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In chapter 2, verses 18 and 24, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and said thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and bought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they should cleave unto his wife, and they should be one flesh. <clears throat> I think it was Matthew Henry that said that, um, as to chapter 2 here, the point out, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he said that God created you know, um, Eve out of man's side, not out of his feet to be subjected to, I mean, there's lines of authority, but you know, not, not to be subjected to like a, a second class citizen and not on top to lord over the man, but aside to be his partner in life. And um, which I, I, was, I thought that was, I, every time I read that, I think of what Matthew Henry wrote about that. Um, but again, God's created an established order for a male and a female and there's, as you all know, there's established roles for males and females in a relationship. <clears throat> um, turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 10. And I was hesitant at first to do this when the Lord brought this to me because of the sensitive nature of it, but you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Um, Mark chapter 10, um, in verse 6, Jesus said, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, so they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And just in Ephesians, <laughs> excuse me, chapter 5 here. Um, Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Sorry, I'm <coughs> sorry, fighting some cold or something. My wife's been trying to convince me to go to the doctor. I've been stubborn. I, I'm probably going to have to do it eventually. Um, Ephesians um, chapter 5, verse 11. Paul said, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. I just want to, um, to say that, that... Um, because we're heading into talking about the Bible talking about sodomy now, and that's the unfruitful works of darkness. I've gone given examples of what the Bible wants for man and woman, how He created us, created us to be, you know, two as one. It's not two men together, two women together. It's a man and a woman together. And. Um, So first we'll go over, <coughs> sorry, some examples of, of sodomy in the Bible here. And as I read this, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll know why it's wrong. For, turn me first to Deuteronomy chapter 23. And among the many sins that the Israelis um, were involved with was male prostitute religion and sodomy was evolved in some of the, the a, lot, a lot of the pagan religions that they got tied up with that God told them not to do. In Deuteronomy, Moses warned them 
there should be no horror of the dials of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And you can keep in mind, in the King's Bible, sodomite means two men having sexual relations together. In 1 Kings, what was it? oh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy was 23, verse 17. And in uh, 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24, the Bible says, And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Again, they were involved in those pagan religions involving sodomy. In 1 Kings 15, verse 12, the Bible says, And he took away the Sodomites out of the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And that was for um, King Asa. What happened is during the Old Testament times, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> Israel would have ungodly kings, they would engage in these religions, and then every once in a while they'd have a good king, and they would, they would do away with the, the sodomy and the, the pagan religions. Interestingly, um, in J. Vernon McGee's uh, Through the Bible Commentary, he mentioned that when he was in seminary, the professors used to have a test on all the kings of Israel and Judah, and um, you'd have to say which, if they, I guess that they list the kings, and you'd have to put down if they were godly or ungodly. And he said that people that did that were lazy could just put down ungodly and get an 80 still. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I remember, I, I remember, for some reason, I, so J. Vernon McGee, a lot of his commentary is, it sticks with you forever. I just remember, remember that one that um, he said, guaranteed 80, <laughs> guaranteed 80. Second <clears throat> um, Kings chapter 23, verse seven. And wife flipping there. It's just going to be another example of a, a good king that um, broke down broke down this uh, this practice. Um, it says, um, and he break down the house of the Sodomites that they were by the house of the Lord, where the women were hangings, wove hangings for the grove. Again, just as you see, there's a pattern that um, sodomy was definitely a problem in Israel. <coughs> Now, the language that the Holy Spirit used in the New Testament talks about this horrible practice, too. In Romans chapter 1, and I'll flip with you all here, too, so... It, Romans chapter 1, verse, verse 26. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> For those that weren't able to be here on Wednesday, um, I had 52 Bible verses, and um, somehow the list I had made, it, was not, it got out of order, and I got all tied up trying to find... So, <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Some, some of the verses, <coughs> I apologize, some of the verses. But um, Romans chapter 1, verse 26, uh, we actually, let me, <clears throat> I'll start at verse 23 here. Paul's talking about the <clears throat> sins, sins of mankind here, and he says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who change the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile afflictions, for even their women to change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust towards one another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves their recompetence of the error which was meat. <clears throat> Let me find my note for this. <clears throat> of course, reprobate 
means morally corrupt, depraved. The Bible says it's things that are not convenient. In Romans, um, same chapter 1, I read that one, right? um, 28. All right. If you turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and then this is just, um, I'm going somewhere with this, don't worry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> of course, Paul had in terrible troubles with the Corinthian churches. <clears throat> um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul said to them, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulter adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor executioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And we're seeing a lot of the, uh, again, in our society, we're seeing the media taking men, if they act effeminate, it's praising them, saying that they're brave for coming out. And that just goes against what the Bible teaches. We cannot condone that before that. We can't be in a position where we're telling people that it's okay. And um, <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 10, 1 Timothy 1, verse 10. Again, Paul said, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which came into my trust. And that, again, he's just going after that lifestyle, saying it's wrong. In 2 Peter 2 7, Peter calls it filthy conversation. Oh, turn with me to Jude, please. Jude, right before Revelation here, Jude. Um, <coughs> Jude has a, a good one, too. Jude talks about it, too. And it'll tie into where I want to go next, anyways, with this. Jude, verse 7. Jude said, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, set forth an example, severing the vengeance of eternal fire. Again, just um, condemning it. Um, in Genesis chapter 18, you all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to touch on that too here. <clears throat> now, the reason I want to talk about Genesis 18 real quick is that a lot of the modern liberal churches tell us that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is a lack of hospitality. I kid you not, that's what they teach. I remember um, when I was a United Methodist, I encountered many United Methodists that told me that, to tell me I was wrong, it's not condemning homosexuality, it's condemning a lack of hospitality to elders. Which, um, and as we go through a text here, see if that's lack of hospitality or is it uh, the combination of homosexuality here. Um, I'm sorry, Genesis 19. <laughs> Genesis 19, sorry. Um, we'll start at verse, okay, we'll start right at verse 19. The angels were heading into Sodom and Gomorrah to see if they can find at least even 10 righteous people. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did break unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come, come past the house around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. When the King James Bible says that we may know them, they're talking about sexual relations. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. In this part, I 
can never fail. I would never do this to my daughters. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, pr I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they unto the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man. Even Lot and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house of blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. And we know the sad story and end, ending of this too. <clears throat> but my point is, uh, and we've heard many sermons over the years about Lot and about how, and it's true though. Lot pitched his gate, his tent towards Sodom because it looked, looked great to him. Then he moved from outside the city into the city. And even though the Bible says that you know Lot was vexed by the you know the the, the filthy lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't leave. As a matter of fact, he became a member of their government. He was at the city gates. And of course, the the you know, we all know what happened to his kids and his family, the ones that did not burn up in a pillar of salt, including his wife. Well, they fornicated with the father to make children. They became the enemies of Israel. Obviously, there's nothing to do with hospitality and that lack of hospitality. God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for that reason. <clears throat> now, this is going to sound silly now, but the next step I'd like to know is, with all this is, what God, does God think of, of sodomy? Of course, turn with me to Leviticus now. And I almost chuckled despite the seriousness of this and, and, and just the sad wickedness because I was saying, you know, what does God think of sodomy? Well, obviously we know, we know what God thinks of sodomy and it's not what our modern society says where they, where they, you know, where, where they teach that, that God like, is okay with that, with that lifestyle and that action. <clears throat> um, first, the Bible calls it, he calls it an abomination. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, the Bible says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. There's no way you can sugarcoat the word abomination. It's not good. Sodomy bore a death penalty in the Old, Old Testament with the, with the Jews. In Leviticus chapter 20, going to verse 13, Israel was told, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them shall have committed an abomination, and they shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. <coughs> In Romans chapter 1, verse 32, Paul said, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. Um, <clears throat> it was pleasurable to the, the people committing that act, but it's still an abomination before God. Going back to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 25, sodomy defiles the land. The Bible says, and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity upon, therefore upon it, and the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. And I know, I believe in, I believe in, the, in dispensations, I think that's the proper way to study the Bible. And I know Leviticus was, was written for the Jews in a different, different dispensation. But there's so many things in the Bible that still apply to our, our, our life today. And it's my opinion that a part of the fall of our country right now, we see the wickedness happening, it's because we, our country condones this. And God's letting our country, letting the land vomit out her inhabitants. He's letting, we can see God's hand of protection slowly being withdrawn as most, more and more Americans turn from God and turn against Jesus and, and brag about how they're atheists and they're anything but being a Christian. And we're seeing the fruits of this. Is not just homosexuality itself. It's it's a combination of all of these sins that we're doing. It's all because the country as a whole is rejecting Jesus. But I just thought that was an interesting verse there. Looking at her, look at our country right now. And I covered Romans one twenty six to twenty eight and, and Jude. <clears throat> Let me get to the next. Oh, here you got Luke. Good, perfect time. Right. It 
if you turn to me to the first Corinthians chapter six, and then we'll get to the, the next step here where I, I think the Lord's led me on this. Um, we see through all the New Testament, obviously, that that God condemned sodomy. We um, And there's more verses than just that, but I just read off today. But obviously we can see, you know, I mean, I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse, so to speak. We, we know that God's against it. I mean, I know I'm, I'm speaking to a sympathetic uh, church membership here. We all, I think we're all in agreement of that. But the question I was, how, how do you deal with people that are living that lifestyle? And we know, of course, <clears throat> that if, um, anyone who's living that kind of lifestyle is welcome to come to our church and worship with us. I'll, I'll, otherwise, they're not going to hear the gospel, they're not going to hear about Jesus, and they're not going to change and repent and change their lifestyle. So obviously, we don't want people of that persuasion not to come here. The thing is, of course, and anyone living that kind of lifestyle cannot engage in any church activities, especially if they're a member doing that. They can't, they can't sing in a choir, usher, work the nursery, and anything, ride, you know, drive the bus, just like anyone that's living any kind of unrepentant sin, blatantly like that, you know, for example, say if someone's, say if a couple's living together in sin, they're not married, and well, obviously, we're not going to let them usher or sing or anything like that, too. It's, that's saying, it's just about church discipline. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, and I thought this was interesting, too, Paul said, and, you know, he mentions all these sins. And then he says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And that's one, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, that's why I um, remind us all that <clears throat> with this sin, it's like any, any sin. We all sin, we all make mistakes. And when dealing with, um, with gay, and, gay and lesbian people and, and people that practice that, we want to teach them that we want to show them the gospel, show them the love of Christ, we want to tell them about Jesus and how to be saved. Um, when I deal with people that are homosexual, they, I've had homosexuals in Las Vegas that I used to work with say to me, I'm going, you, you think I'm going to hell because I'm a homosexual? And I'm like, no, you're not going to hell because you're homosexual. You're going to hell because you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and, and that's, that's the key, just like we do for anyone else. Um, you know, if we're waiting to say a Roman Catholic or a Jehovah Witness or, or anyone, just we want to keep focused on Jesus and the gospel and, and um, just how we all sin. And th their lifestyle is a sinful lifestyle and God condemns it. But they need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior first. Um, Tracy and I know of a lady that used to be part of our Methodist church in Las Vegas and she was a, a godly lady and knew a lot about the Bible. And um, she did a testimony from the church once that where she said that um, she was gay and she was not practicing anymore because the Bible told her it's a sin. So she ended that lifestyle, broke up with her mate or whatever it was, her partner. I think she called her partner, partner, and 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 started living a godly lifestyle. And she said she still had those thoughts of being attracted to females, but she would never act them ever again because she, she loves Jesus too much and Jesus taught her that that lifestyle is wrong. So um, I always respect her for that, for just speaking out. We talk about, people talk about when they, people come out saying they're, um, coming out saying they're gay and how brave they are. No, to me, this lady was brave. She went from her church family, said she was gay, and then said she, you know, had to be repent of it, and she was living for Christ. And, and I just remember that too, that again, just my point is just, you know, um, keeping it about Jesus is, is the important thing. <coughs> and, with with the remaining time we have, I just want to um, cover um, a section on judging. A lot of times, as a Christian, when you condemn a lifestyle choice of someone like that, you tend to hear, judge not, least ye be judged. I couldn't tell how many times I've had Christians and non-Christians, especially non-Christians, that, that, that burns my chaff when the non-Christian says to me, I know it's in your Bible, judge not, least ye be judged. And that's usually when you're saying something about, say, if you're t saying the homosexuality is wrong, and the person you're talking to is not saved and they're offended, they'll throw that in your face, and, and then they, you know, then they say, um, or if I'm talking to a more liberal Christian, and they'll say the same thing, they'll, they'll say, they'll say, judge not, least you be judged. But when people say that, they're taking that verse out of context. <clears throat> so in Matthew chapter seven. 
Jesus, let's take the whole, look at the whole verse here. Judge, judge, Jesus did say this. He said, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, we shall be judged. And with what measure you met, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, when behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of, a, out of thy brother's eye. If you take the whole verse in context, what Jesus is talking about, <clears throat> he's talking about hypocritical, ju hypocritical judging. Um, for example, I, I, I don't smoke or drink, but it would be a similar thing if, if I was if I was drunk and, and, and chain smoking like a chimney, and I, and I would tell Amanda, don't smoke or drink, Amanda, well, I would be a hypocrite. I, I mean, I, I would be telling her it's wrong, knowing what it's doing to my health, but at the same time, my actions would be hypocritical to her. And, and Jesus is, is, is saying that first, yes, first, we have to look at our sins and our shortcomings and take care of that. But we still can, we still there are certain things we can judge. The first thing we can judge is we can judge sin in the church. If you turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> and again, when we do judge, we have to do it in a loving, Christ like manner. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a sin if we're doing it to win an argument or to, or to do a gotcha or something. You know, it has to be done in the right spirit. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, Paul said, For I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit have judged already, though I am very present, were present concerning him that have done so the deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in that section, there was reported that there was fornication among them, and that one person had his father's wife. <coughs> And of course, that was a scandal in the church, and the church, they weren't scandalized by it. So Paul was judging him. He said, you know, he, Paul was saying, that's wrong. You can't do, you can't do that. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 5, Paul said, I speak this to your shame. Is it so that, is it not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. <clears throat> we can judge each, uh, each other. If we see a, one of our church family members engaging in a sinful activity or possibly engaging in a sinful activity, you know, we can say, I don't think you should be saying this or doing this. Um, there's times even, you know, and, I mean, people, everyone has, you know, rough days. Say, say if someone's saying this talking, you're talking to one of your friends that's a Christian and they're starting to get angry and they're starting to say something that could lead to sin because they're angry. Then, as a Christian, you're allowed to say, "Hold on, you may want to calm down and not continue on what you're saying because you're heading into sin." Um, <clears throat> in First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, the Bible says, "We're to judge preaching. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge." And that's an important thing um, to judge preaching. That's something as a whole church body we're, we're to do. If I say something up here that's not in the Bible, I, I appreciate when feedback when people say when people say no, I think you're wrong there, and here's why. Maybe you show me about why I was wrong. I'll, I'll admit I was wrong and apologize. And um, I know a pastor always says this, and and anyone that up, that up here behind this wooden pulpit speaks preaching or teaching ever will will say you know don't take our words for anything. Look at the Bible verse for yourself and, and re research it yourself as well, just to make sure we're not leading an error. <clears throat> and it does take an entire church with the way society is going and the way even independent Baptist churches are all a lot of them are starting to turn to the ESV Bible and they're starting to accept some CCM rock and roll music into their, into their congregation like that Lancaster Bible Church Baptist Church in California um, they're taking like CCM music and instead of guitars and drums are playing they're changing it to piano and choir melodies but you still have the rock and roll type of backbeat and the piano is taking their place of the drum so you have to be careful, even in music, we have to be very cautious you know, in, what, in what we bring in here because we do not want to fear from what the, the old ways are. We want to keep, you know, keep going where we're going. Um, in, in Ephesians chapter five, the 
the Bible says in chapter 5, verse 11, Paul said, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So when people say, Okay, Mark, you know, who are you to condemn homosexuality? Right here, we are to reprove wickedness, the unfruitful works of darkness. If we see sin happening as believers, we're allowed to call it out and say, that's wrong, that is sin, that's wickedness. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm almost done here. First, yeah, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. Paul said, But he is that is spiritual, judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> We're allowed to judge all things, again, through the mind of Christ. We have to um, take our Bibles. We have to, you know, read our Bibles. You've heard this before. Read our Bibles, know our Bibles, know what's in it, know where to find what's in it. Memorize verses so that we know what's right and what's wrong. So when we see something wrong happening, the first thing that happens in your mind, you hear you, you, a lot of times, even if, um, if I'm hearing a, even a, a sermon on, on YouTube or, or some app or something or somewhere on there and I'm listening to the sermon, once in a while I may, I'll hear something, I'll say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. And then you have to stop and research in the Bible. And then often with, um, <laughs> as I'm fortunate, with a lot of them, preaching, even in some, um, in, in, even in independent Baptist churches, you have to be careful sometimes because what they say, you have to <coughs> go back into the Bible just to make sure what they're saying is, is true. For an example, <coughs> that Jim, that Duggar family, the 19 Kings of Kine, the, Dug the Duggars, um, I mean, my family's watched that show before for years, and we always were like, wow, you know, that's awesome. They're, they're a Baptist family, and they have a big kids and a big family, and they, and they dress appropriately, and, 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 you know, there were some things we were like, yeah, it's kind of a little out there, but, you know, but, but um, it turns out they're followers of a man named Bill Gothard, something called the IBLP, <clears throat> and is independent Baptist, but a, um, a lot of their beliefs are things that, we would not condone in our church, and they, they go too far, and they take a, he took a lot of Bible passages and beliefs that beyond what they were supposed to be. So again, just going back to just, again, just through Christ in the Bible, we have to be very careful, even among independent Baptists. Um, but getting, but, <coughs> excuse me, I don't want to veer too far on that, but. So hopefully I didn't offend anyone too much. I, um, I just wanted to explain here what the Bible says about homosexuality, especially since it's Pride Month. And, um, and I felt like I found that at work when I'm dealing with um, people that are homosexual, I, um, I have not condemned their practice that way directly to the face because I've never had any of them ask me what do you think of my lifestyle because when I tell them about Jesus and what the Bible says they can they know so I've never had to get to that point where they've said what do you think about my lifestyle but I do talk to them about salvation and Jesus and um, <clears throat> and, and things like that and when they and like I say when, when they say oh you're just going you're just saying that because of my lifestyle and my choices I'm like I'm like no well, yeah, I'm like we all sin and, 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 and all sins you know all sins will lead you to lead you to hell because you transgress God's law unless you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and repent of your sins and um, and that's something to keep in mind too like I said we're all sinners we all sin every day we sin constantly but the difference is since we've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior our sins have been washed by His precious holy blood and we've been forgiven. And they haven't been yet, so um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. And um.